my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now you're
today we're going to reside in the book of Philippians chapter 1, and I want to speak to you for the next little while, a sermon entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. A Matter of Life and Death. Follow with me, Philippians 1, verse 18. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached? And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what choose I do not know. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So may God add his blessings today as we look at a matter of life and death. Someone has rightly noted that as a Christian we live in two worlds. We lay up our treasures in heaven We look forward to the day when we will go to heaven. We know that Jesus has prepared a wonderful home for us in heaven. We have a new name in heaven. Jesus himself is there in heaven. So there's a part of us that that longs for that heavenly home. But at the same time, we are forced to live in this world. And even in this world that is sin-cursed and fallen, there are certain attractions that hold us to this world. We all have family here, and that's why we want to live as long as we can. We all have things we still like to accomplish, and we want to live as long as we can. So we really experience this this, uh, dilemma of living in two worlds. We want to go to heaven and be with the Lord, but yet none of us, I would say, are ready to go today necessarily. We're ready in in that we know we may be saved, but not ready and that hopeful that today would be the final day of our lives on the, this earth. It's kind of like the little boy who was in Sunday school and his teacher was teaching about heaven. And she laid out the beauties of heaven, the streets of gold and the walls of jasper and the gates of pearl. And she just painted a beautiful picture about how grand heaven would be. And she said, how many of you here in this class want to go to heaven? And every hand in the class went up except for one little fella. And she said to him, son, do you not want to go to heaven? And he says, well, ma'am, it's like this. My mom said that she's baking chocolate cake after lunch today. And I want to be around for that. So we have these ties that are very real, much more significant than chocolate cake. But that lets us know the dilemma of wanting to go to heaven, but needing to fulfill life here on earth. When you come to the book of Philippians, along with Ephesians and Colossians, and Philemon. It is one of the four prison epistles penned by the hand of Paul during a two-year imprisonment in Rome. The time was somewhere around about 62 A.D. And in this first chapter, what Paul does as he writes this letter to a, to a church that he founded, many of the people there, he led them to faith in Jesus Christ. And while he is now imprisoned in Rome, he writes back to Philippi and he encourages them for how much of an encouragement they were while he was among them, how they joined hands together to uh, further the gospel of Jesus Christ how they led people to faith in Jesus Christ. Then, if you were to read these opening verses in verse 1 and following, you will see that he brings them up to speed on his condition in prison. He is not mad about being in prison. He is not in despair. His attitude is not one of discouragement and depression and defeat, but it is actually just the opposite. He is joyful. In fact, if you know anything about the book of Philippians, what's the key word all the way through the book of Philippians? Somebody say it. Joy. Joy. You read it over and over again. We would think being in prison, 
being accused of something that you did not do, being arrested and not knowing when the death squad of Nero would come in and cleave your head from your body, we would think that we were done for. And we would have ourselves a pity party, but not Paul. As he writes to the church at Philippi, he said, God actually used this time of imprisonment for me to be able to preach to the Praetorian Guard in Rome. And Paul would literally see many Roman guards come to faith in Jesus Christ. And um, because of that, he says, God is working in spite of the circumstances. I just want to say at the outset of this message, I know things have been disrupted by COVID-19. But COVID-19 does not disrupt the work of God. God can still work, and God is still working all around us, just as he was in Paul's life in this Roman prison. You may feel as though you are in some sort of a prison if you've been laid off from work or you're not able to go teach your class at school or you're not able to work in your restaurant or whatever your situation may be, God can take the worst of the worst situations and He can still work through those times of difficulty to bring glory to Himself and advance His kingdom. That's exactly what Paul was experiencing. On the outside, we would say things certainly look bleak. But on the inside, I want you to know his heart was racing because of the joy that God had put in his heart. Notice what he says. If you will back up to verse number 12, he begins this way. He said, but I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which had happened to me, coronavirus, race riots, prejudice, statues of of some of our founders being removed. All of the things that have happened to me fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel, meaning God can still work in spite of all of this, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. And many of the brethren, notice this, in the Lord, waxing confident of my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. In other words, Paul witnessing to the Roman guard that he was chained to and apparently leading that Roman guard to faith in Christ. When other believers at Philippi had heard about this, they were so inspired that if Paul's doing that while he's in prison, I can do that when I'm not in prison. Right? If Paul can do that when his circumstances are bad, I can do that regardless of my circumstances. So they became much more empowered to share the gospel. They became much more courageous. And then as Paul writes this letter back to them, he commends them for that. And I'm just so inspired by Paul's life because it is not easy to go through problems. Listen carefully. It is not easy to go through problems and to see a bigger picture of what God wants to accomplish through that problem. If you're experiencing a time of sickness and you know you have surgery waiting, it is very intimidating, isn't it? And it is hard not to look at that surgery and think, what if this happens and what if that happens? When reality, what God wants us to do is to see the bigger picture of it and how we might be able to minister through our time of sickness when somebody else that we know is going through a very similar experience. So Paul was able to see the bigger picture, how God can work even in times of hardship and difficulties. When he writes these words, he is waiting for his sentence. He doesn't know if his sentence is going to be death. He doesn't know if he's going to be exonerated. He doesn't know if he's going to be freed. Or again, he doesn't know if Nero is going to send his executioners come to come and to take his life. So the Philippians are very, very concerned about him. This was their founding pastor. He had led many of them to faith in Christ. They wanted him to be well, and they were very worried about him. But at the same time, they were very heartened when they saw the joy and the confidence that he projected. So what I want us to do for the balance of our time today is I want us to see how the joy of life is connected to two perspectives. This will be our proposition. How the joy of life is connected to two perspectives. How we view death and how we view life. That's why I say this is a matter 
of life and death. Notice verse number 18. He writes, What then, notwithstanding? Every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, and yea, will rejoice. Now, what was happening back at Philippi, there were two primary groups of individuals. There was one group who was totally on board with Paul, and they were sharing their faith. They were trying to grow the church. They were trying to advance the kingdom of God. And then there was another group that while Paul was absent, they were tearing Paul down while they were trying to build themselves up. And it has been said that a person who is all wrapped up in themselves makes a mighty small package. So as, as Paul is dealing with this through this letter, he says it doesn't matter what is happening as long as the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached because that takes precedent over everything else in life. So Paul gives us this encouragement, listen carefully, to always keep the main thing the main thing. The devil throws up all kinds of smoke screens to get us distracted, does he not? He will throw us a, 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 some kind of a, um, a distraction down this trail or this trail or this trail and get us running trails and chasing rabbits. When in reality, what Paul would say for you and I today is just what he did to the church at Philippi in A.D. 62. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Share the gospel because we know we are in a battle and the spoils are the souls of mankind. And the devil would love nothing more than to drag individuals away from God. But we have to stay focused and we have to stay fixed on what is the main thing. And Paul exemplifies that in a wonderful way. Notice in verse number 19. He says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Here it is. Whether it be by life or by death. He says, whether I live or whether I die, I want Christ to be magnified in my life. Remember the context? Where is he? Prison in Rome. Waiting possible execution. And he just simply comes to this realization that, yes, I could die. This could be the last day of my life. Or I could be set free. So he says, whether I live or whether I die, it's going to be okay. And you know, I think only a Christian can approach life in that manner. That whether I live, it's going to be okay. But if I die today, and listen, I don't want to die today. I want to live as long as I can. But if I die today... It's going to be all right. I can't tell you how many funerals I've preached. And I've used this text to say that we don't have any control over what happened to us today or what may happen to us tomorrow. But if we live, God will be with us. And if we die, praise God, we go be with Him. And it will be all right either way. Amen, church? It'll be all right either way. And that is where Paul is coming from. Is he concerned? Sure. Is he discouraged and depressed? No. Whether I live or whether I die, it's going to be okay. Look what he says in verse number 21. One of my, one of my favorite verses. In fact, probably not a greater statement found about life anywhere in the Scriptures. Look what he says. Verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's not just a theological assertion but he's speaking from the heart of genuine love for Christ that for me to live, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to continue my mission trips around the world, he says, and I'm going to continue to plant churches. For me to live is Christ, and I'm going to continue to advance the kingdom of God all over the world as long as I can. And he says, but when I die, I've not lost anything. I've gained everything. Do you know of a statement in the Scripture that speaks to the true meaning of life more than Philippians 1.21? For me to live is to serve God. For me to die, I've not lost, 
but I've gained. F.B. Meyer said this, Christ is the essence of our life, the model of our life, the aim of our life, the solace of our life, and the reward of our life. So during this two-year incarceration, he's sitting there in that Roman prison cell contemplating his view of life and his view of death. And he says, well, if the prison doors swing open and I'm able to go free, I'll just go right back to doing what I've been doing, and that is advancing the kingdom of God. But if the hooded executioner comes to my cell to bring me to the chopping block, he says, it's going to be okay that way as well, because for me to die is gain. I want you to think about that for a moment. For me to live is Christ. It has been presented this way. For me to live is blank. And you fill in that blank. What is most important in life to you? For me to live is success. For me to live is money. For me to live is influence. For me to live is Prestige For me to live is popularity. What would you put in that blank? Paul says, for me to live is Christ. He would say later on in the book of Philippians that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So for me to live, he says, is Christ. Jesus said it this way. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Anytime we want to see how rich we are, all we need to do is add up what death can't take away from us. And all that you and I have that death cannot take from us is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Death can never claim that, can ever, never interfere with that. So that's why Paul would say, for me to live is my relationship with Jesus. Listen to what Max Lucado said. I lifted a paragraph from him that I want to share because only Max Lucado can, can write this way. Listen to what he says. Should a man see only popularity, he becomes a mirror reflecting whatever he needs to be reflected to gain acceptance. He is everyone and no one. Should a man see only power, he becomes a wolf prowling, hunting, and stalking elusive game. Recognition is his prey, and people are his prize. His quest is endless. As a result, he who sees only power is degraded to an animal, an insatiable scavenger controlled not by a will from within, but by luring from without. Should a man see only pleasure, he becomes as a carnival thrill seeker, alive only in the bright lights, the wild rides, and the titillating entertainment. With lustful fever, he races from ride to ride, trying to satisfy his insatiable passion for sensations only long enough to look for another. Seeker of popularity, power, and pleasure. The end result is the same. Painful fulfillment only in seeking his maker does a man truly become man. Let me read that part again. He says, uh, only in seeking his maker does a man truly become man. For seeing his creator, man catches a glimpse of what he was intended to be. He who would see his God would then be the reason for death and the purpose of time, destiny, tomorrow, and truth. All are questions within the reach of the man who knows his source. And Paul certainly knew his source. For me to live is Christ and to advance his kingdom. Remember I told you that our proposition is we gain joy by two perspectives, how we view death and how we view life. So the first part of that is I want you to note how Paul's view of death brought him joy instead of fear. How his view of death brought him joy instead of fear. Because listen carefully, how you view death is the key to how you will enjoy life. If we do not have a biblical worldview of death and dying, 
then we will be paralyzed by fear. What if this happens and what if that happens? But remember Paul's words, it's going to be okay either way, whether I live or whether I die. That is the Christian perspective of death and dying. The Christian perspective of death is not that we see death as some sort of a tragic end, but we see death as a vehicle that carries us to the presence of our Creator. We see death as release from a body that is sick and broken and maybe diseased and release from a world that is filled with pain and trouble. And we see death really as a, as a, as a divine pallbearer bearer that takes us to the very presence of God where once and for all we lay down this body and this world of sickness and trouble. So how we view death determines how well we enjoy life. That's why, if you go back to verse number 21, look at the words, to die is gain. Circle that word gain. It means profitable. It was actually a word that was used to talk about the interest that was gained on money. He says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So he doesn't view death as the end. He says as great as life is, death would be even better because it has a greater payday. Death is gain. Why do you suppose, why do you suppose he would say that? It is because he knew what awaits the believer when we die. How did he know that? Back up a few pages in your copy of God's Word to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Do you remember the time that Paul, uh, in fact, I spoke on this in a devotion a couple of Wednesday nights ago. Do you remember how Paul was called up into the third heaven, into the very presence of God? Listen to what he says about that. He says, um, verse 2 of chapter 12, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one was called up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man. Now, he's writing this from the third person. But you'll see in a little while, he switches to the first person pronoun. He's actually writing about his own experience of this, this uh, encounter that he had in heaven. He said, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, how he was called up into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. And he goes on to talk about, because of all that he saw in heaven, that the temptation was to become so heavenly minded, that's all he talked about. And that's all, all his life would focus on. So God would send him or allow him to have a thorn in the flesh that would kind of bring him back down to reality. So if you go back to Philippians 1, when Paul says, for me to die is gain, why does he say that? Because he's drawing on what he experienced in heaven in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, I saw things there that no human vocabulary can ever begin to describe. I heard things there that I cannot begin to communicate what all it was like. So he has this vision of being called up into the very presence of God and he says, if that's what awaits the believer, for me to live is Christ, but to die is not loss. To die is gain. So he sits in this jail cell and he knew, knows at any moment he could lose his life, but he is not discouraged. He's not depressed. He's not giving himself a pity party. He is not saying, why me? He is not focused on himself and he is not inward focused. He knew that whenever death would come from him, listen, that it would take him out of a world that can sometimes be fair, unfair, and it would bring great gain to his life. He knew that when death came, that he would no longer have to deal with difficult personalities because he would be in the presence of God. When death came, he would no longer have to deal and live in a sick body because he would have a new body in the celestial city of God. That's why he says, for me to live is Christ, but when I close my eyes in death and my lungs go flat and my blood stops circulating through my body, I have not lost, but I have gained. Look in verse 23. Notice. Let me read verse 22 and 23. He says, But if I live in the flesh, 
This is the fruit of my labor. I mean, I go ahead, I, I plant churches, he says. I, I uh, promote the kingdom of God. He says, yet what sh I shall choose, I don't know. Now, can't you see him in this jail cell? And he's thinking, is it better for me to keep living so I can keep serving God? Or is it better for me just to go ahead and die and go on to heaven? It really was for him a matter of life and death. And as he's wrestling this in his mind, look at what he says in verse 23. For I am in a strait between two. Look at this dilemma. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So I'm in this strait between two. Some translations say it this way. I am torn between two. The King James, you see that word straight. It comes from a Greek word that means to be compressed. It means to be uh, hard-pressed, to be in a, a dilemma. It is a situation where you can't turn to the right or turn to the left. Have you ever been in a situation like that? That you really find yourself in such a dilemma that you don't know which way to turn. Well, that's where Paul is. Listen, here's the picture in the Greek. I love this. It literally is a picture of putting your hands over your ears. Do you know psychologists tell us that sometimes when people are deeply overwhelmed, particularly they say in smaller children, when they go through a time where they're overwhelmed, that one of their coping mechanisms is to put their hands over their ears. I can see Paul in this prison. And he's sitting there with this parchment in his lap and this pen in his hand and he's writing to the church at Philippi. And he said, I'm just in a strait between two. To go ahead and die and be with Christ, which is far better, but yet continue the work of Jesus and building the kingdom. And it's like he just puts his hands over his ears. And he said, I'm, in a, I'm torn between the two. Look at, uh, look at the word depart in verse 23. If you're listening, say amen. He says, for I am in a strait between two. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Circle that word depart. It comes from a Greek word that means to break camp. It has the idea of taking down your tent. When you finished your camping days, you just take down your tent, you pack up your tent, you get ready to go. He says, I'm just one side of me. I'm ready to take down my tent. And I'm just ready to go. But the other side of me, I still want to go plant other churches and I want to advance the kingdom of God. So can't you see this, this struggle, this dilemma? Hold your place here. I want you to go to the book of 2 Timothy for just a moment. 2 Timothy, look in verse number 4, if you will. We read these passages as well at times of death and in a, a funeral service. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Look in verse number 6. Let me hear those Bible pages turning, all right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Now look at this. He says, for I am now ready to be offered. That's a, a play on an Old Testament drink offering. In the Old Testament days, they had a number of different types of offerings. One of those offerings was a drink offering where the drink was literally poured out on the altar. And this great apostle says, I have now reached a place in my life where my whole life has just been poured out for God and I'm ready to die. Notice what he says. He says, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but uh, unto all of them also that love his appearing. I want to camp out just for a moment on that word departure. Because remember, we're still looking at Paul's view of death. How does he view death? Look at that word departure. There are three or four ways that it's used in the New Testament that I think is a um, subject of interest to us this morning. He says, the time of my departure is at hand. Here's one of the ways that word was used. It was used for a, a chemical compound that was placed in, a, say, a, a tablet form 
placed in uh, water, and that chemical that was in that tablet, it dissolved into the water. It still has the same potency. It is just now a different state from a solid to a liquid. I look at that, and I think about Alka-Seltzer, right? Plop, plop. Fizz, fizz. Now, all the young folks say, what in the world is he talking about? But those of you, you my age, you know what that means. It's a tablet that dissolves into the water, but it doesn't lose any of its potency because it's dissolved. In fact, it takes on greater potency and is able to get into our body much better than if we were just to take the tablet. I remember, I remember when I was preparing for my mission trip to Guyana. And uh, I was packing my stuff and, and getting everything ready. And I have my checklist so I don't forget this and forget that and forget this. And a um, uh, number of items that we were needing to bring. And I remember that Tina picked up for me um, uh, kind of a tube of vitamin C tablets. Are you all familiar with these? Or vitamin C tablets. And she says, this will boost your immunity. That way, when you're over there, um, you won't get be as likely to get sick. So start taking these now. So uh, a little bit later that day, they were on the counter. I passed by. I opened the box. I took out one of those tablets, and I just popped it in and went on my way. And I want you to know it started fizzing, <laughs> and it started bubbling, and I look like um, Old Yeller with rabies. You remember that? You remember Old Yeller? Again, the young folk are saying, Old Yeller? Anyway, I, it was fizzing and bubbling and Tina said you dummy you're supposed to mix it with water dilute it with water well that's Paul's usage of this word departure he says for now the time of my departure is at hand and he's talking about that when he dies that his body will be changed or his death will bring about a change I should say that when he dies that there is not annihilation he just moves from a earthly body, a mortal body, into heaven in a soulish body waiting for his glorified spiritual body one of these days. So upon death, there's not annihilation. We just move from this world into heaven. And Paul says, now is my departure at hand. I'm not going to just, uh, my life is not going to be like a candle that you just blow it out and that's it. Oh no, I'm just changing states from a body of sickness to a spiritual body that'll never be sick again. And then there's a second time this word departure is used, and it was used to describe a prisoner that was set free. A prisoner whom had served his sentence, the door is open, and he is now free to leave. And when you par compare that to our lives, sometimes we live as a prisoner in a body that is sick, a body that gets old. It happens to all of us, doesn't it? We live in a body racked with aches and pains. But one of these days when death comes, it is just like the prison doors being opened so that we can leave this body of sickness. The third time it's used, it's a nautical term, and it literally means to weigh anchor and set sail. A ship that is ready to go out to sea, they hoist the, the sails, they ro roll in the anchor, and you just step on that old ship of Zion and you're just ready to go to meet the Lord in that celestial city. That's what the old hymn writer meant when he wrote the song, My Heavenly Home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. No pain or death will enter there. I feel like traveling on. And one of these days we'll drop this robe of flesh and we'll stand before God, and my prayer is we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? So how we see death affects the how, uh, how we see life. And because Paul, because of his view of death, he had joy because he knew death was not the end for him. Let me just say before we move to the next point and bring this to a close, for a Christian... You do not have to fear death. You don't have to fear death. Now, I want to live as long as I can. And I pray that I do live as long as I can. And I know that God has prepared for me a place in heaven that when I die, that I'm going to go there, not because I earned it or deserved it. Heavens know neither of those are true. 
but because God so loved the world that he made that available to us. So I want to live as long as I can, but I'm not afraid to die. Now, I might worry about the process, <laughs> and I don't know what the process may look like, but I'm as confident that the Bible is true as I am standing here in this place today. And I am as confident that the Bible is true in what it says about death, that for the Christian, death holds no power. If I didn't believe that, I'd go find something else to do with my life. It really is a matter of life and death. So, Paul's view of death brought him joy instead of fear. But secondly, Paul's view of life brought him joy instead of worry. His view of death brought him joy instead of fear, and his view of life brought him joy instead of worry. Look in verse number 22. He says, For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, he says, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with, your, with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may bo be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Life is sometimes painful. Life is sometimes disappointing. Life, sometimes we may feel, has treated us very unfairly. But listen, may I say, there's never been anyone treated more unfairly than the Lord Jesus. And when he died on Calvary's cross, he could have said anything that anyone could have said, but what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he died not a bitter, angry man, but he died as the consummate example of what it means to live with hurt and to rise above that hurt and to still demonstrate love. You see, Paul is not saying that those difficult times were easy. Think about his life for a moment. You can read his resume in the book of Corinthians. And he said, I was shipwrecked. I was beaten with rods. He said, I was in perils of my countrymen, in perils of robbers, in perils of the deep. He was treading water all night long, not knowing if he was going to be able to have the strength to make it to the next uh, uh, seashore. There was a time in his life when, uh, when he was in the middle of a hurricane. King James calls it a rock, Eurocladon. And his boat was broken to pieces. He struggles to make it to shore. And just to gather a little bit of firewood to keep himself warm, he gets bitten by a snake. He never says life is easy. And he never says that things are going to go easy for us. But in all of the struggles of life and how he viewed life, he leaned on the promises of God. And he would say, whatever the circumstances are, it's going to be okay. Whatever the situation, it's going to be okay. And he chose to rejoice, listen carefully, in the promises of God rather than despair over the difficulty of the circumstances for which he had no control. That was his secret to joyful living. He believed if he was given more days on the earth, that it was for a purpose. So he intended to live productively. For me to live is Christ. So how you view life, how we look at life in the great scheme of things determines whether we live with joy or whether we live in despair. And Paul said, I'm not going to live under the circumstances. I'm not going to live defeated. I'm not going to live backing up, but I'm going to live moving forward because Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, he never puts more on me than he puts in me and gives me the strength. So, in closing, listen, we have to understand what life really is. And when we understand that, we have joy instead of worry. Life is a treasure. God gives us an, uh, not an infinite amount of time in this world, but a finite amount of time. 
I don't know how long I will live. You don't know how long you will live. But we know the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. We are all living in a finite world and finite bodies. And we have a finite amount of time. But it's what we do with that time that makes a difference. So Paul would say, invest your time in the work of Christ. Secondly, we must deliberately focus on not only this world, but our heavenly home. I was telling someone the other day, isn't it interesting how I'm seeing this in my own life the older I get? How infrequently we thought about heaven when we were young. As a young person, I don't know that I thought about it that much because my body didn't hurt. (laughs) I'm telling you, I think about it quite, quite often nowadays. We think about heaven more and more the older we get and the closer we get to heaven. And more of our friends are now living on the other side than what live here. And then little by little we're drawn closer and closer and closer to that place. Paul said, whether we live, we live it to its fullest. Or whether we die, it's going to be all right. As long as, first of all, you're sure of your salvation that you've made that decision in your life to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice has done that, but my worry is that not everyone in this auditorium has done that. And in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to give you that opportunity just to come and say, Pastor Darrell, I want to know what it means to be saved, and I want to give my life to Jesus. If you will do that, the Bible says there's joy in the presence of heaven over one sinner who repents. And then... Not only be sure of your salvation, but then be intentional in your growth for Christ. And then you too, like Paul, would say, for me to live is Christ. Meaning it's the greatest life in the world. But for me to die is even better because over there I have what I can only dream about down here. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. For your word that is truly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you, God, that it is a matter of life or death. Your word says, I have set before you life and death. Choose life. So as we have this hymn of invitation, that's what we invite people to do is simply choose life. There may be folk here today that have never been saved. I pray they would come as we have this invitation. Others who want to unite with our church family or they just want to come and pray for lost loved ones or God, they just want to come and bring a burden to the altar. Take the invitation and do with it what will honor you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.